Digital marketing has changed the way companies interact with customers and how leaders interact with employees. As a business leader, influencing the people around you, ensuring alignment and effective communication is a stepping stone to the success of a business. In today's episode, we will aim to determine why leadership is now the strongest marketing strategy. There are over 100 market strategies that have been used by organizations over time. The difference between loved companies and disreputable ones lies with the perception of the public. Effective marketing strategies require efforts that will generate desired outcomes, such as closing sales. A market strategy advises on saying what, how, and who the brand target is in order to make sales. However, the decision on how the information is transmitted and received by consumers is decided by the company's leadership. Friends, thank you for watching Business World. We'll be right back. Friends, welcome back to Business World on MDC TV. And today we have Professor Richard Tapia. He's a professor of political science and international relations here at Miami Dade College. Professor, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Yeah. Excellent. Professor, uh, so we're talking about digital marketing today, and I see that there's a strong digital presence as well as in the media, and it seems like the, the most recent messaging is about uh, inflation. And one thing that I did notice is that many people, everywhere I go, they're talking about the high cost of products in the supermarket. Um, what, what do you, it, is that our biggest inflation issue, or do you think that perhaps the inflation is, is more severe in the housing market? What, what really matters here? Well, I think what one has to take into account when it comes to messaging, whether it's political messaging or business messaging, it's the message that's going to resonate the most with the common person. So when it comes to politics, a politician, a president getting reelected or not, there tends to be what's called the leadership attribution of error. So whether things are going good or bad, if it's associated with the leader or not, but the, the leader is the one that ends up getting blamed for it. And inflation tends to be the biggest factor within the economy that determines whether a person gets elected or reelected. So when you hear political messaging on inflation, right. you tend to see the same thing. They tend to focus on groceries. When you hear it in the business sector on CNN or on any other network, you tend to see the same thing taking place over and over again. And that tends to be because it's where the common person sees it the most on an everyday basis. Now, where they're going to probably feel it the most is when you're talking about housing, when you're talking about car purchases, which are the big ticket items. Right. But every day, day to day, type of issue when it comes to inflation is going to be at the grocery store. It's going to be at the pump. It's going to be at the gasoline station. And that's why you tend to see this type of messaging focus in on groceries and, and the gas pump. Well, that, that actually explains it uh, very well because um, a lot of people I, I speak with, they tell me, um, you know, they say, well, yeah, it's true that, you know, uh, for example, you know, the price of ketchup is, is, is high, right? Or the, or the price of milk or all, all sorts of groceries. But then they, they say, but, but how come they're not talking about <clears throat> the inflation when it comes to housing? Because a, a recent article uh, by the Miami Herald said that, um, in, that inflation, housing inflation in South Florida is up uh, 40%. On or about, you know, the, the, these things right. switch, but the latest article was uh, on or about 40%. And, um, you know, if you, if you do the math, uh, let's say your average home in South Florida is, you know, $500,000. Right. I mean, 40% of that, that's, that's like $200,000. Know? When, when, so you, that, yeah, yeah, so. when you look at economic development, mm -hmm. there's a lot of factors that, that feed into economic development, but three prime factors that you need in order to, to have economic growth, good, sound, stable, sustainable right. economic growth. You have to have a strong educational system. You have to have a good transportation system. Right. But you need to have affordable housing. If you don't have affordable housing, what, what ends up happening is that the jobs don't keep up to pace with cost of living, and so your workforce tends to leave. A major problem having, mm -hmm. happening in Florida and in Miami-Dade in particular is the, the teacher shortage that we're having. That's right. And there's a lot of factors, but one of the biggest factors is the fact that cost of housing has not, when you look at wages, 
wages have not kept up with cost of living, and in particular, cost of housing. So teachers recently got a raise. However, that raise doesn't keep up with the 40% of inflation okay. when it comes to housing. If you look at inflation, last year was about 8%. The year before that was 4%. Okay. This year, I believe we are at 3 or 4%. So you're talking about close to a 15% increase within the last two to three years, probably 20% right. since the pandemic had, had taken place. And that's, that's very much aligned with the feedback I'm, I'm hearing from the people. Um, and just, I mean, just imagine, I mean, you know, one of the, one of the comments that, the, that they were telling me at the supermarket was, you know, imagine if, if you're paying $200,000 more, yeah. right, the 40% inflation, imagine having $200,000 of uh, disposable income, you know, Right. Many people just would not even, you know, worry about the rising cost of ketchup, right? I mean, these, these things sound uh, frivolous compared, compared to the, the real issue. Yes, and what it demonstrates is the importance of an education, the importance of getting not just an associate, but an, a certificate or a bachelor's degree in a high marketable, marketable area, especially when you talk about AI, artificial intelligence, right. which tends to be, if you were to ask me, a lot of students have asked me, what are some fields mm -hmm. that are going to grow within the next five to 10 years? Without a doubt, it's going to be artificial intelligence. So the college is now the only program in the state of Florida Right. that offers a bachelor's in artificial intelligence. So when students have asked me, how do we compete? How do we keep up with high cost of housing? And the best answer is you need to be able to get a degree, a job mm -hmm. in a highly marketable area in which you're going to be able right. to, to basically keep up with inflation and keep up with the demand in, in the jobs that are needed. That's, that's, a, that's a very interesting point. And, and I guess, um, uh, let, let's take that on the flip side of it. Right. Um, what about, I know the college offers programs in political science right. um, and digital marketing, of course, but what, what about if, I mean, the, the, I don't know what your thoughts are on, on this, the, the possibility that perhaps we need to also <clears throat> engage on the political advocacy Right. And, and lobby or organize for... for well, artificial for intelligence right. is going to affect all of those industries. If you look at the 2016, 2020 elections, you begin to see the influence of artificial intelligence when it comes to messaging. You mentioned digital messaging. Right. Today, AI is being used to be able to create psychometric, psychometric profiles on every single one of the users of social media. Incredible. Everyone that basically buys anything digitally is being tracked. And so there's one particular company that is famous and really infamous overseas called Cambridge Analytica, oh, yes. because Cambridge Analytica used exactly that. They created psychometric profiles to use right. AI, and they figured out what type of stimulus mm -hmm. would get a buyer, get someone to vote a particular way for a right. candidate. They packaged candidates like if they were marketing any other product. And the same tactics that used for selling goods, used for selling politicians. What type of messaging, what kind of news stories, what type of stimulus would get the person angry or fall in love with the candidate or give them hope or make them fear right. a result or an outcome of an election. So today with AI, it applies to so many fields, whether it's political advocacy, political science, international relations. In fact, a lot of the new courses and certificates that we're beginning to develop here at the college touches on AI. And so the leadership here at the college, whether it's the administration or the board of trustees or even the faculty, they're now taking into account on how do we move forward how do we incorporate AI? How do we incorporate digital marketing? Right. Not just to get students to come through our doors, but really create marketable skills for them to apply to different occupations. Wow, that's that's uh, that's really interesting, and you know, it's going to be like you said, very uh, pervasive through all all fields. You really can't escape it. I also right. I was reading an article um, about also law that even the legal system right. actually is going to have a lot of AI because it tells you this is a way for to separate <clears throat> the you know the biases that happen right, right. and say okay well, you know what what's the crime you know what are the priors what are the sentencing guidelines and and right. uh, have a sentencing 
uh, outcome based on, on the data, not, not you know, socioeconomics, not race, you know, all these other issues that we're facing today. Correct. In fact, if students are really interested in that topic you, you just touched on, mm -hmm. the faculty here at Miami Dade College developed an AI and ethics course, not just for philosophy, but also in legal studies, right. where they examine those types of issues. We're also mm -hmm. examining AI and international relations when it comes to game theory. And when it comes to trade, when it comes to arms races and the security dilemma, you know, how can AI better predict not only what's going to be the outcome of a conflict, but what's going to be the best way to deter a conflict from taking place? Interesting. And on, on that note, on game theory, uh, can you, uh, you know, tell us what the difference is between a zero-sum game and a non-zero-sum game? So the mm -hmm. easiest way to explain it to the audience, zero-sum means win-lose. So it adds up to zero. So someone, one actor gets a plus one, an opposing actor gets a minus one, and it equals up to zero, hence where the term zero sum comes from. But it essentially means I gain while you lose, right? A non-zero sum game is we both gain. Now we may gain at a different outcome. I may gain, let's say, in a trade relationship, I may gain $10 while you gain $5, but we're both better off than where we started. That would be a non-zero-sum game. So when you look at AI, mm -hmm. AI has the ability to look at all possibilities right. within a trade relationship mm -hmm. and say, what's going to be the best outcome for all parties? So it, it's kind of like being able to play out a million scenarios or two million scenarios in about one or two seconds, and AI gives you possible outcomes and you get to kind of take a look at those outcomes and see, would this be something that all parties can, can live with? There's a great scene, if you're a Marvel fan, and I know there's people out there that's a Marvel fan, in the Avengers Endgame, right. where Doctor Strange is able to <clears throat> basically look at two million possibilities of the future because he had the time stone. Well, think about being everybody having that ability with AI. And that's what's so revolutionary about the informational age, that today every individual is empowered to be able to look at all possibilities. Tom Freeman, and thank you for being late, talks about three accelerations in today's international society. Right. One being technology, AI being the best example right. that leads to greater mm -hmm. globalization, that then kind of creates more environmental issues, but again, it accelerates the development of technology to be able to solve these issues. So the fact that an individual could acquire AI, or in the words of Steve, jo Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. It's not about technology being in the right hands. It's about technology being in everybody's hands. On that note, <clears throat> on that note, uh, they say that human nature is constant; it never changes. <clears throat> you know, Marcus Aurelius wrote a, a book, *The Reflections*, and he talks about how human nature is the same. But technology is what they call a variable; it's always changing. Right. What, when we come back from the break, let's speak a little bit about the uh, the dangers of having such a technology with on, on human hands and I know many uh, <clears throat> entrepreneurs like Elon Musk have uh, spoken uh, about the dangers of, of AI. Friends, we'll be right back after the break. Right here today at Miami-Dade College at the Wolfson campus in the heart of downtown, we opened up our new AI center. This builds off the AI center that we built at the North campus, and this is going to help students prepare for the future of work by learning AI, artificial intelligence, throughout the curriculum and for the jobs of the future. I feel down, down the path from seven months till now, it's going to be really important really acknowledging how the tools really work, spending the time, using it, prompting it each day, trying to get a text or trying to get an image is going to be as important because when you're trying to get a, a product or when you're trying to get a, 
a job at a company, they're going to ask you, are you actually utilizing AI? And actually, do you actually know how to utilize AI? Because it's not just typing some words and then achieving something, but it's actually giving it the right feedback and telling it the right words in order for, for you to get that actual solution that you're trying to achieve. And so spending time, I think, is the most important now from seven months till now. Friends, welcome back to Business World. So we left off talking about the dangers of AI. Many entrepreneurs like Elon Musk are, are you know, creating all sorts of content, telling us about uh, the possible dangers of AI, but yet they can't kind of pinpoint exactly what danger, but they know it's gonna be a danger. Uh, so there's a lot of mystique around this. What, what are, I mean, some, some, some of these, I mean, not even Elon Musk well, knows, but what, what could be some of these possible dangers? I mean, is this like a Terminator well, what, you know, what, movie? What or what, Elon, what's going on here? You know. What Elon Musk kind of uh, presents, kind of the dystopian hellscape that could come about that you've seen in many movies, whether it's The Matrix or Terminator, right. is a real fear that humanity has with any type of new technology. We, we saw this with nuclear weapons, rightfully so. Right. And AI will definitely be a game changer, similar to the nuclear age. So there's definitely a lot of room to be concerned about. Henry Kissinger just right. gave presentations about the dangers of AI, and these dangers are extremely real. So the first country that gets the sentient AI, what we call singularity, right. is going to have a tremendous advantage over all of the other nations on the planet and will create American primacy if America reaches it first. Now, where many people see doom and gloom, many others like myself see hope. If you read Peter Diamandis' book, a book I highly recommend to all of our students to, to read, a book called Abundance, you basically see why there, there is a lot of possibility for hope in creating and solving many of the problems and creating new solutions for the problems we've existed. For instance, we have the problem of overpopulation. But with vertical farming and the reorganization and the administration of government through AI, right. you can make things more efficient. So there is a lot of possibility for hope. Some people are, are worried that AI is gonna displace so many jobs at such a fast pace that the entire system will collapse. And that's kind of a Marxian perspective to the doom and gloom of technology causing the economic system to collapse. However, others like Joseph Schumpeter, very famous Harvard economist, would talk about creative destruction. As AI is destroying jobs, it's creating new ones and new possibilities. And that's the route that the college is taking when we're offering this new bachelor's of applied science in right. AI. We see the possibility of four new jobs being created for every one that's being destroyed. And in doing so, it's gonna create the highest elevation of wealth. Think about being able, having AI, sentient AI, being able to create new solutions to mathematics, to science, right. creating new products more than ever before, being able to find ways to desalinate, wa desalinate water and solve the sure. water crisis. I mean, the technology is there. Correct, or solve the climate crisis that is right. taking place. So. I really do believe there is more reason to hope out of AI than there is the fret. And I think, how do we make sure that kind of this positive vision of AI goes forward how do we and, do not, that? and not the dystopian hellscape? Right, how do we it's do by offering programs like we're doing here at Miami-Dade College and basically training the next generation of student, the next generation of scholar and practitioner on how to harness AI for the right reasons. There are those that are gonna to try to harness it for the wrong reason, like Chaos so, GPT, but uh, Chaos GPT, which was a program that was created with the intent of, and the programmer basically gave it a simple objective, mm -hmm. destroy mankind. And so Chaos GPT went out and tried to basically find the strategy to do that. Right. But the other GPTs, the other AIs, kind of teamed up and basically said no. Okay. So, so that gives hope. Right. It does, to a degree. I, you know, I, and I see your point. I mean, the, the applications are, are really, you know, life-changing. It will change, literally, it will literally ch has the potential to change the world. There's no doubt. I mean, no. but if we look, I mean, you know, you know you're a political scientist. If we look at uh, human nature, you know, they say that, the great philosophers, they say that human nature is a constant. It does not change. Whereas technology is a variable, it changes, like, you know, we're talking about AI now and all, all, all it can do. You know, it's, um, and, and you mentioned that it's about education. 
training our students to utilize AI in an appropriate way. But this would require a high degree of ethics training, a high degree of, you know, not, it's not only a formal education, but it's, you know, edifying uh, a human being uh, in, in, I would even say, to a, a, in a spiritual capacity and a collective well-being capacity, you know, because, well, because we've seen history. Look, look, what, look, look, well, at, look at the actions of... are going to disagree on human nature, right? So what is human nature? Are we selfish? Are we destructive? Look at Do we have a collective self-interest? And the history. philosophers are going to disagree. And how you interpret and how you see history, right. how you see international relations, is going to have different perspectives based on the different sure. theories that sure. you look at it. I tend, mm -hmm. I tend to have the perspective that we have a collective self-interest. It is human nature to come together. However, if that's true, then how right. do you explain the, the cases of, let's say, authoritarian or totalitarian regimes sure. that have brought chaos sure. and uh, active, mass destruction to the system. Now, active how, shooters, how, how do you explain could, an active shooter? So yeah. how, how you explain that, right. depending on the different perspectives, is going to vary. And so philosophers do disagree right. on what is human nature. Now, how do you train, how do you train the next generation right. to take a look at these issues? By debating it openly by sure. doing active research. Yeah. And that's why the bachelor's degree in artificial intelligence also has the AI and ethics course, which, which examines those types of issues Wonderful. thoroughly. What is human nature? Right. Is there such a thing as human nature? Are we a blank slate, right. as John Locke would say? Or do we have a natural self within the state of nature, as Jean-Jacques Rousseau and others right. would say? And does it get distorted based on technology? Well, Does it get distorted based on are, civilization? These are, right? points. these are the types of questions these are great points. that future scholars are mm -hmm. going to have to look sure. at with technology. And, you know, we talk about this. You, you mentioned does it get distorted with technology. You know, I would say the answer is emphatically yes. Let's just take a look at uh, social media and what it's done to America in the last 10 years. I, I would also argue that it's distorted by ideology. Just take a look at, you know, uh, what Russia has done in Ukraine. Take a look at the indoctrination that's happening in Cuba. Imagine uh, AI in the hands of these regimes, which have a lot of money. Imagine AI in the hands of the Communist Chinese right. Party. Right? Which is exactly what Henry Kissinger was talking about in this last week. He turned 100 years old. Right. Former Secretary of State, for those of you who aren't aware of who Henry Kissinger is, a realist by every definition of the word. Yeah. So when you look at the balance of power taking place, AI is definitely going to shift that balance of power. So who... Who governs and to what ends is the two great questions in politics. And having a tool like AI is going to alter the power relationship in the world. Right. So how do you begin to plan for it? How do you begin to make sure that it doesn't, and if it does fall into everybody's hands and you have non-state actors that are more empowered than ever before, because it's not just going to be, let's say, scientists and mathematicians and no. political scientists who are going to have it. It's going to be right. terrorists that are also going to happen, just like they were empowered on 9-11 using technology, airplanes, yep. and the Internet to recruit and basically orchestrate attacks right. upon humanity. You're going to see AI is going to be leveraged for the same thing. So being able to have AI and develop it first and being able to that's create safeguards that's is exactly what not just Kissinger, but many people have, have been saying, and the reason why the United States wants to reach AI and singularity before anybody else does this, in order to have primacy. This sounds like the new arms race, like the new uh, nuclear arms race. It is. It is. It is. It is the game changer. Just like nuclear weapons were the game changer at the end of the Second World War that gave American primacy, it's going to be what's going to change the power relationship and really possibly create, once again, reaffirm a unipolar world in which the United States, when I say primacy, it means the United States is the sole superpower. Right. However, let's, let's be realistic. We're not going to be the only nation that's going to acquire AI. So what is the world going to look like when all of the great powers have AI. Well, we know, we know what uh, China and the Russians want to do. They, they, they don't want to have a, a, a monopoly in world powers, as, as they call it. They want a, a unilateral powers. They want to they be a Russian Multilateral, superpower. Right. They, right. they, they want to have a Chinese superpower. And to that end, they've done a, an amazing job in, in terms of digital marketing, specifically with um, the... the the TikTok uh, social media network, 
which uh, many of the uh, U.S. Uh, politicians, including uh, one of the Florida senators, is, is talking that TikTok poses uh, a clear and present danger to the security of the United States. And by... It definitely does. By yes. some of the things you've yes. mentioned, by collecting data, collecting Correct. consumer behavior, and that gives you the ability to craft messaging that will be, be you know, military-grade uh, technology messaging uh, certain people to act a certain way. And, and, and it works. Data works, right? So if there is ever a conflict, they, one of the senators argues that if there is ever a conflict between uh, the United States and, and China because of Taiwan, that because of the data that TikTok has, they will craft messages to, okay, we know that, uh, that Professor Tapia's uh, you know, son is in the military. We're going to craft a message for you saying don't, don't uh, support this war because your son is going to get hurt or, you know, this type of very specific data. Um, <clears throat> what is being done to address this uh, danger of uh, national security danger of TikTok? Is, is there something? Well, right now the legislation Senate, the Senate is trying to ban TikTok and trying to get people to get off the TikTok platform because it is collecting data. It's mm -hmm. creating psychometric profiles on Americans, and that type of information could be used to try to manipulate election results, trying to manipulate there voters, yeah. which is the accusation that not just the CIA, but all 17 intelligence agencies of the United States made against the Russian Federation in the 2016 election, right. that they interfered using troll farms overseas that basically put up fake news, fake stories right. within Facebook, within social media, to try to manipulate voters to vote a particular way. Yeah, that's a, this is, these are all, uh, I would say, uh, challenges that we're facing in the, in the digital age. Uh, and, you know, I, 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 like you said, I think the, one of the keys is going to be that we need to push back with effective legislation to, this is all unchartered. This is a whole uncharted territory. So I, I think we're kind of figuring out as, as we go along how, how we're going to compete in this, in this uh, new digital, digital age. Professor, thank you very much for coming. This has been a very spirited debate. And thank you for your insights. Friends, thank you for watching uh, Business World on NBC TV. Until next time, we'll see you then.